This is the crash course covering the topic of software architecture. A software architecture is a high-level organization of a software system. Such an organization can help us understand the system better. It can facilitate achieving software qualities such as security, performance, maintainability, and so on and so forth. So having a high-level organization uh, makes it easier to understand the software system and makes it easier for software engineers to develop the system in a correct and efficient way. As you probably understand, a software system is quite complex and a software architecture is a broad topic and we will not talk about all the aspects about software architecture in this course, of course. Uh, we are focused on the source code and the development we will actually focus on the so-called logical and development views. You can look at a software system from a process or hardware points of view also, and, and there are many other views to consider. But we will take a look at uh, the logical and development views. So we will focus on the source code and possibly on the external libraries and components that you uh, use to develop your system. The idea is that we should be able to use developers and experts efficiently. So if we are many developers, we need some kind of division of the system so that we can focus on our little part and let that part be easily integrated into a larger whole. You can also imagine that after some time as a developer, you become a little bit of an expert in certain areas. Maybe certain technologies is your expert area and then you would like to uh, utilize your expertise in this area when you also develop a system. It is also important that we can understand how a system works, how the source code is organized and what parts are responsible for what kind of functionality. You can imagine coming as a new developer to a, uh, to a somewhat big system it's nice to have an overview of how is the source code organized, what libraries do I need to uh, install in my development environment, what are the dependencies for, for these between these uh, parts of the system. It's also nice that if you need to change some part of the system, it may be a new feature, uh, it needs to be added or tweaked, then this change will not affect the system as a whole. Another advantage of having a nice structure to your software system is that uh, when a bug report comes in, it's often easier to find the root causes. So all of these advantages uh, can be summarized all, almost in the word modularity. We want our software system to consist of well-structured modules that are connected in a clear and concise way to other modules so that we can keep a control of the system. And this makes it easier to, for example, reuse a module test the module in uh, isolation and all of these continuous practices that we want, for example, continuous deployment and things like that. To some degree, modularity can also uh, help in uh, understanding performance of a system and assuring that it's uh, secure. The basic notation we will use for this in this course is the UML package diagram. Also having text descriptions is not uncommon. You can here see a small example of a package diagram showing a quite common division of a system. At the top we have a user interface. This depends on some business rules, which in turn depends on some a data module that maybe loads data from a database or something like that. So notation is not that hard. Again, uh, the problem is of course how should you create and organize these uh, modules or these parts of the software system? And the simple answer is to use uh, existing knowledge and experience. Especially as new software developers, you don't have a lot of experience of large systems in different types of domains. So it's good to know what has already been done and, and what works and what works less well. And the absolutely easiest way to use a software architecture in your, in your application or system is to use a framework. A framework is simply a skeleton design and implementation. In this case, you don't really need to invent the software architecture yourself. It's already there. 
This makes the frameworks quite easy to use, especially if they're suitable to your problem, to your system. As they are large, they, are, they often uh, entail a learning curve, so you need to spend some time in understanding how this framework actually works and how things are to be done. They are often quite specific, and this means that they are often tailored to a specific type of platform, for example, a web framework, uh, or a, a type of problem, a specific type of system that this framework uh, is good for. So frameworks are the easiest uh, solution to this problem, if you can find one that is suitable. The next level is to use a pattern. A pattern is simply an abstract problem, so a problem that is described in a quite generic way, and an abstract solution. That is the solution to this problem described in a generic way. Using a pattern is uh, often quite easy, but you need to make suitable choices yourself. So you need to adapt this abstract solution into your concrete solution. And that of, of course uh, entails some work and you need to implement this. So uh, patterns often come with examples, but you need to implement and make this specific solution uh, that is suitable for your needs. So maybe a little bit more of design work. It's not ready to go, so to speak. And last, we have uh, principles. And this is more of a loose description of an approach that is generally seen as good or as a standard in, that, in, in certain types of uh, systems. Principles are often quite easy to understand and motivate, but they can be hard to adapt to your specific needs, as you need to make a concrete design and implementation that builds upon this principle. You can look upon this, these three parts as a kind of like a pyramid that we have the principles as the foundation, then principles can be realized in patterns and patterns in turn are often used in frameworks. So by understanding principles, it is easier to understand patterns and by understanding patterns, it's easier to understand frameworks. So the uh, principle we will be using in this course uh, is the model view separation principle. And it's a principle that's applicable to interactive software systems. That is a system that is used by a human, which is quite a lot of uh, systems. And the idea is that often user interfaces change quite frequently. So we have different types of technologies that change. And this is probably not something that we in our software development company can really affect. So there are new APIs, new platforms, uh, that uh, we need to support or our system risk becoming obsolete. Also, our different users may have different needs. Uh, for example, we can have different roles in our system and different user experiences. Maybe some user would like to have a really efficient command line interface and a more beginner user wants a graphical user interface for basically the same type of functionality. As said before, developers are often experts. Uh, programming a good user interface, especially a graphical one, uh, requires quite a lot of knowledge. And that knowledge is maybe quite different from uh, a machine learning expert, a database expert, and so on and so forth. So uh, being able to utilize expert efficiently is uh, a good thing. So in general, the idea is to separate the user interface code, and we call this view from the more business functionality or rules that are called model. And we would like to have view depend on the model and not the other way. This means that we can have several different user interfaces based on the same type of model. We can reuse the model in several different, different contexts. And hopefully the model is more stable. Business rules and functionality tend to not be affected as much uh, by technology uh, than user interfaces. So having a separation between them and not letting the model be affected by changes in the user interface will let us develop the system more efficiently. As an example, you can just take a look at basically every API you can find on the web. You get JSON as a response from these uh, the service requests you make, 
and not HTML. So if you got HTML back, then you would probably need to parse the HTML and remove all the user interface stuff before you can do your own user interface. Basically, this is an example of model view separation. So let's take an example of model view separation in practice using a small example. Uh, this is Java code and in Java you would probably use packages to have a model package and a view package. In this example, I've just crammed everything into one main class. So from that point of view, it's not a good example, but we need to fit it into the presentation. So we have a model class and it's this person class here. It has a first name and a last name. And when you create the person, you supply the first name and the last name. There's also a view class, a console person printer. So the idea is that we would like to print the name of a person into the console. So we have this function print person that you simply takes a string name and the name is and prints the name is uh, this uh, argument. We have the main method that creates a new person and creates a new printer and lets the person print itself using the printer. And in this example, we have a violation to the principle as the model class person calls the view class console. So we have a dependency from model to view in this case, and that's not what you want. So doing this is not advised if we are to follow the model view separation principle. So instead of taking a string as an argument here, we just send in the person and let this um, console person printer get the name from the person and print it. So we have separated the model from the view. So there is no call from the model class to the view class. However, there is still a responsibility that is connected to the user interface, the view in this uh, class. We have the formatting of the string. For example, let's imagine that we would like to have another, uh, another type of console printer that prints the name in a different order. So we don't want the last name first, but the first name first. Doing this would require us to parse this string and get the names, the first name and the last name, and this would just be super duper messy. We would like to avoid adding this type of view responsibility into model classes. That's also one of the ideas, model view separation. Model classes do things that are connected to the business rules. View classes do things that are connected to the user interface. Formatting of strings is connected to the user interface. Yet again, we need to improve our design here. And finally, the solution is to let the model class have functionality to return the first name and the last name and let the console printer decide on the order and the separation symbol used when it wants to print it. In this way, we can have several different types of console printers that can do this with uh, in different orders, maybe just print the last name. So by looking at the logical and development views of the software architecture, a developer will easier understand how to structure the source code and what parts of the responsibility should go into what classes. To conclude, the logical and development views of a software system architecture is centered around modules and the dependencies and responsibilities of these modules. We would like to assign module dependencies and responsibilities so that development becomes easier and more efficient. To aid in this, we can use principles, patterns or frameworks.